How did Summon Skull get unsummoned? I don't know. How did Summon Skull get unsummoned? Through a compulsory evacuation device, because at least that's from the right game. Ah! <laughs> this guy. I don't get it. Hello, friendos. This is Chain welcoming you back to Chain of Commander. It is time for our monthly visit back to our recruitment office. And uh, this time I decided to bring in a friend of the channel to talk about one of his many decks. So if our guest here would like to introduce himself. Sounds good. <clears throat> All right. So I am <clears throat> the one, the only, the unsummoned skull. What's up? <clears throat> I I tend to build to build unsummon effects into different decks. That idea started because I used to do color challenges when I was uh, teaching in person, and I had a games club, and the students would always say that blue is the weakest color because they couldn't figure out what to do with unsummon, and so I showed them all kinds of different things, and I made my channel to show just how many different things unsummons can do. All right, and which uh, which commander did you bring for us to talk about today? Well, this deck isn't really designed so much around the commander itself, but it's Voro of the Hulkade. Voro of the Hulkade. Okay, that's the one that's one green-blue for a 1-4 legendary creature, Human Merfolk. And you can pay green-blue and tap it to double the number of each kind of counter on target artifact, creature, or land. So, looks like it's like super proliferate, but it doesn't affect planeswalkers. And, but you said it, your deck isn't really built around this ability at all. Um, it has some things in there that work with it. There's a reason why it's the commander, although I have mm -hmm. given some thoughts to changing it. Um, Voro is one that I really enjoyed seeing in some of my friends' dedicated decks. I also just like how many different things the commander itself can do, and that a deck with Voro as the commander is going to be doing some crazy shenanigans because Voro itself doesn't do that much. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. All right, and um, when you sent this over to me, you you call this deck uh, Simic Burn, which I, is not an archetype most people are familiar with, because is it even an archetype? Well, according to what you said, yes, it's a thing. So what what's going on here? What is what is Simic Burn? Well, <clears throat> I mean, Simic has everything else right now. Why can't it have Burn too? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, this deck is designed around uh, using unsummon effects to increase the amount of cards the opponent has in hand for certain effects that care about the number of cards opponents have in hand. There are a few other things in here that trigger when somebody casts something. And when you unsummon something, they have to recast it afterwards. So there's a few different Punisher group slug type effects, but there are also some big shot damage in here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, what are some of those incremental effects that you were talking about there? Well, one of the uh, more obscure incremental effects is Primal Order, which deals damage at the beginning of each player's uh, upkeep equal to the number of non-basics the, the deck has. I put that in there originally with the, with the design of possibly having a couple of non-basics in the deck, and then I realized when I make a deck, usually they have to, as I call it, earn um, the non-basic lands. So mm -hmm. I only put in basics on the first iteration of a deck, and then... They earn the right to have non-basics put in. But when I played this the first time with Primal Order in the deck and only basics, I realized people are pretty greedy with their mana bases, and that does a good job of tenderizing opponents for the big chunks. So ah, that's one of the true, more obscure true. ones. It doesn't necessarily have directly to do with unsummons. Mm -hmm. No, but like you said, it, it, in EDH, people are going to be running non-basics of plenty. So if you could break that parity and really punish them for it, it's kind of like uh, Green's response to Back to Basics, I guess. But you don't run in here, but looking at the list, you could probably get away with it if you wanted to be super mean. Yeah, that. well, the problem is Back to Basics... Oh, yeah, Back to Basics would sort of trap some things in opponents' hands, which mm -hmm. is kind of good. Uh, I have other ways to do that, though, and, I, and they're bigger and splashier. Plus, I like the idea of the opponent playing things out and then that's where the uh, the mass removal comes in. I have several mm -hmm. different mass removal effects in the deck that put everything back in hand. So, for example, I've won a game before with River's Rebuke returning an opponent's entire board, and then 
the opponent having their entire board in their hand when I storm secret them, which deals mm -hmm. damage to the opponent equal to the amount of cards in their hand. That is, yeah, that could be a big old one hit, especially if they got 10, 15, 20 stuff in their hand in the late game. Oof, that is that is definitely a powerful, powerful move here. Uh, now, one card I saw that you had here, you don't really have a lot of creatures in here at all. And the creatures in here, on the whole, make a lot of sense. But the one that I really, really kind of liked here um, was Cloud Thresher. So I want you to go a bit more into why Cloud Thresher is in this deck. Well, it's in there pri um, primarily because damn it, it deals direct damage mm -hmm. uh, to opponents. It's also there because it can flash in and hit somebody at an inopportune time, especially after somebody board wipes. Mm -hmm. uh, you're going to have a lot of mana in this deck because you're drawing a lot of cards, and about half of the mana uh, of the uh, the mana increasers are there. Because when you draw a lot of cards with Howling Mind type effects, you're going to have extra lands in hand and you want to be able to play those out. So mm -hmm. uh, being able to hard cast Cloud Thresher isn't necessarily difficult. Uh, there are some ways to return Cloud Thresher and be able to reuse it. It's also a really nice flip off of Mind's Desire. Oh, indeed, indeed. Yeah, that's something that Cloud Thresher has evoke for like half of its mana cost. So you can evoke it. And then with the evoke trigger on the stack, bounce it back to your hand with something like an unsummon. Exactly. So five mana to get the same effect. All right. That is that is definitely a super spicy piece of tech. And I, I really, really appreciate its existence in this deck. Also, you, you mentioned Mind's Desire. This is one of my favorite Storm cards. I never got to play it in Legacy because, it's, you know, it's been banned in Legacy since like forever. But Storm is one of my personal favorite mechanics. And this out of all the Storm cards is one of my favorites. So, all right. Uh, the last one. Fun chaotic mm -hmm. element. Indeed. indeed. You, you never know what you're going to get. So, a lot of fun. All right. Anything else about this deck you wanted to bring up here? Because I thought, like, you, you gave us a pretty pretty nice, thorough explanation of what you got going on here. There are a couple of uh, win conditions. Uh, I can bring up a little bit of why Voril is the commander right now. Uh, okay. There are a few different uh, ramp effects that, that work better with Voril, such as uh, Jeweled Amulet, Pentad Prism, Chalice, Coalition Relic. I, I don't have the three mana of uh, the three mana version of Chalice in there because mm -hmm. uh, that costs a little bit too much to be impactful. Yeah, that one? Astral Cornucopia, I think. Yeah, I, I don't have the Cornucopia in here because I want to be able to impact the board a little bit more, mm -hmm. but. Those are some ramp cards that get better with Voril out. Plus, Voril, I, I include it as part of my ramp package because Voril is also just a good roadblock if somebody's going faster than you. It's so one of the nice things about having a cheap commander is that uh, you don't necessarily, uh, if it's not necessarily part of your huge game plan, it's just something for them to, or for something to block. Mm hmm. The deck and it's got, list. no, yes, yeah, a very good blocker, too. Four defense, four toughness there. Yeah, with four toughness, it's a pretty good blocker. Um, and it can also always do things like block something bigger and then you unsummon it back to your hand and then recast it for three. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, <clears throat> so that's uh, a little bit of why he's there. There's also some other effects such as... Um, so within my... Uh, mass removal, I have Ratchet Bomb and Engineered Explosives. Engineered mm -hmm. Explosives can't really get rid of some really big things, but with Voral it can. Ratchet Bomb's also nice to be able to sweep the board of tokens. That's true, yeah. Take that, Tristani players. Yep, and then a couple of the win conditions that are better with Voral are, uh, well, one of the reasons I built the deck was Malignant Growth, because it was such a weird-looking card. Uh, Malignant Growth has cumulative upkeep one. During uh, So each turn you pay one, then two, then three, then four. Mm -hmm. So it gets, uh, you, you, when you put an age counter at the beginning of your upkeep. Uh, during your upkeep, put a growth counter on Malignant Growth. During uh, target opponent's draw phase, so now it's each opponent. There's a few different cards in here that, that function that way. That mm -hmm. are each opponent, even though they're printed as target opponent. Um, here she draws an additional card for each growth counter on malignant growth, and then they take one damage for each card they draw this way. So uh -huh. you can always do something like <clears throat> double the counters on malignant growth. It doubles both times, <laughs> so you can't reasonably keep it out, but you can do something like go mm -hmm. from four to eight. Draw eight cards, and... take eight damage, and then take damage from 
uh, some of the other effects in the deck when you draw yeah. cards, like Ebony Owl, Nitsuke, Skull Cage. Those are some of the old school burn effects. Yep, Psychosis Crawler, the classic, you draw cards, people take damage things, yeah. Mm -hmm. Praetor's Council um, has, has won a game as well. Uh, so I put that, even though it's more card advantage, you could call it, I put it in my game-winning pile because when you cast uh, Praetor's Council, if you don't win shortly after that, you're probably not far in the deck very well, or you're, you're, you're getting run over. Yeah, because you get all your resources back, and by that point you should have a bajillion accessible mana. Mm -hmm. uh, time Bomb is in the deck as well. During your upkeep, put a time counter on Time Bomb. Colorless tap, sack Time Bomb to have a deal damage to each creature and player where, where that's the number of time counters on it. So it's another thing that Varel can double. Mm -hmm. So in total, there's about 10 cards that work with Varel. Specifically, All right. that's still not that bad. I, it's obviously not like, like you said, it's not the majority of the deck's game plan, but it's it's enough to warrant its choice as being the leader of the helm. Yeah, it's not a Varel deck. It's a it's a mm -hmm. Simic Burn deck. Yeah, just Varel is a nice cheap Simic commander you can get out there. All right. All right. Because All the right. deck is playing from behind a lot, the spot removal, like into the Royal Blink of an Eye, Repulse. A lot mm -hmm. of it draws extra cards to be able to dig further into the deck for the cards that actually win the game. Mm -hmm. And then there's more mass removal in this deck than I would usually put in because of the fact that it doesn't produce a board. But that mm -hmm. allows it to fight through opponents' boards. It also yeah, it's... No, go ahead. It also has varied types of mass removal. Um... Uh, so it's able to kill flyers, it's able to bounce boards, it's able to uh, <clears throat> destroy enchantments and artifacts. So it has different types of mass removal depending on what needs to be gone. And sometimes mm -hmm. if my own things are hurting me, I can get rid of them. Uh, one of the interesting ways to do that is through Multani's Decree. It's a four mana, destroy all enchantments, you gain two life for each enchantment destroyed this way. So let's say I'm starting to hurt myself with some of my enchantments. I can get rid of them. Mm -hmm. And get some nice incidental life gain out of it, too. Uh, yeah, uh, that has actually been relevant in a couple of games. Uh, and sometimes the opponents will thank you for relieving some of the pressure on them. <laughs> uh, of course, you were the one providing the pressure, so... <laughs> You know, it seems like if you're, you're a generous guy, like I will, I will cause this pain to you, but I will take it away later when you get really concerned. Yep. Uh, so interesting cards in here in terms of punishing the opponent. So I mentioned the Punisher effects before. There's Soul Barrier and Thought Prisoner, two of the ones that come to mind. Soul mm -hmm. Barrier deals two damage to an opponent whenever they cast a creature spell. So you unsummon their creature, they have to recast it, and then they take two damage. They also take mm -hmm. two damage any time they cast their commander. Unless they're playing uh, Planeswalker Commander. Mm -hmm. it's, it's difficult to build a board when you're taking two damage every time you cast a creature spell. Mm -hmm. And then Thought Prison is another really interesting one. And I've used it a couple of different ways with Unsummons. So Thought Prison... <clears throat> uh, so it has imprint. When it comes into the play, you may have target player reveal his or her hand. If you do, choose a non-land card from it and remove that card from the game. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the cool things is, let's say you really want something gone. And uh, Unsummon, uh, one of the reasons why I like Unsummon so much is because they're temporary removal spells, not permanent removal spells. So just because something's a problem now doesn't mean it's going to continue being a problem. Mm -hmm. But let's say you know something's going to continue being a problem. I can Thought Prison to egg to Im and use the imprint to exile something that I don't want to see on the board. So somebody casts Avis in the Last Hope. Everything mm. they have, everything they own has indestructible. I unsummon Avis in the Last Hope, and then cast Thought Prison, exiling it from their hand. That is that is pretty smart because then you know it's already going to be in their hand already. Very cool. I like that. Is that is spicy. And then the second part of it, the, the real part of it for why it's in the deck, is that whenever a player casts a spell that shares a color or converted mana cost with the imprinted card, it deals two damage to that player. It doesn't double up, so it, it doesn't stack. But mm -hmm. uh, let's say I do it on a color that's not blue or green. All of a sudden, it's hurting them. It's not hurting me. Mm -hmm. 
And it also triggers unconverted mana costs. So you have to start watching, okay, how much does this thing cost? And am I casting anything with that cost? It's, if it's a common cost, like two, three, or four, it starts to impact the decisions people make. Mm-hmm. And you could take advantage of that indecisiveness by just going in there, maybe talking them out of casting. It's like, oh, you don't want to cast that? You'll take damage. You can't take damage right now. And then you just hit them, hit them with the spells that do damage equal to cards in hand anyways. It's like they can't win. They either take damage when it goes in or they take damage when they keep it back. Mm-hmm. Awesome. All right. yeah, absolutely. So something that's not necessarily obvious by looking at my deck list is that i have a formula with which i build decks and i'm going to start i'm I'm relatively soon i'm going to make a uh a deck building uh deck tech aspect uh on youtube Mm -hmm. but the way that it works is i i have 10 card draw spells 10 ramp spells between 15 and 25 win conditions in this case i have some spillover with other aspects about 10 spot removal and about five um five to 15 mass removal in this case Mm -hmm. i have more mass removal because a lot of it does what the deck is already doing so like hurricane squall line cloud thresher those are mass removal effects that also damage opponents and then mystical tutor and call to mind I consider them part of mass removal because i'll usually use them if i'm behind to try to find that but those five cards I mentioned could also be considered under win conditions. Mm-hmm. So I have a deck where a lot of these cards could could be merged with each other. Uh, because the opponent because I'm having the opponents draw so many cards, I could mill somebody with fascination. Ooh, fascination. That's the one where you draw X, right? Or each player draws X or mills X. Yep. Depending on which one you choose. Okay, yeah, that one. I also have Jace Bellerin. If I'm able to protect it long enough, I can mill somebody with that too. So yeah, I party have Jace. Other outs. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Party Jace is one of my favorite cards of all time. Easily my favorite Planeswalker just because he's the, the hooded mage, and I, lo- I love that image. Plus, he's more of a partner than he is a win condition. Mm-hmm. Although he can be a win condition. Yeah, if the game goes long enough. Mm-hmm. All right. All right, I also noticed, according to Moxfield here, this deck is cheap this is an excellent budget deck doesn't even top a hundred dollars that is i'm not gonna lie this is a really 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 cool deck and for that price it's really hard to say no for at least trying it out uh for a lot of people uh so um at this point if you could if you could take a direct look into the camera you got on your side there i want you to give one last pitch to everybody as why they should consider maybe not necessarily vorel herself but if they something that they would want to consider playing Simic Burn as a commander deck, you should continue, uh, consider playing Simic Burn if you want to <clears throat> play a deck that is fun, functional, and synergistic. It uh, <clears throat> it's never going to play the same way twice, and there are all kinds of different combinations and synergies that you'll figure out as you play the cards together because they work; they're just not obvious. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. All right. So if you like if you like solving puzzles, this might be the deck for you. Mm-hmm. All right. All right. So Unsummoned Skull, if you could just tell us where where the viewers can find you, maybe they can check you out and on their own time and see what else you have in store for us. Well, uh, you can check me out on Twitter at Coach underscore J underscore Row R O. Uh, <clears throat> J Row is a nickname that I received in football from one of my coaches before biology class. It's J Row, like Jennifer Lopez, J Lo, J Row. Uh, you can also find me at twitch.tv backslash unsummoned skull. All right. All right. Well, Coach J Row, if you could, I thank you very much for joining us today. And, uh, oh yeah, I definitely look forward to hopefully play against this deck in some way. This is not one of your decks I've had a chance to play against yet, but I would love to go head-to-head against it at some point in the near future. So thank you very much for joining me today. And to you folks at home, I'll include a list to, or a link to his list down there in the description, just so you can check it out. Like, 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 like you said, this is a very cool deck that interacts in ways that might not be so obvious and definitely worth a try out. So... Like I said, thank you for joining me today. And to all you at home, thank you for joining us. And I hope you all have a good day. Adios. It's been an honor. Thank you.